So good evening to you all and uh, on behalf of the planetarium I extend a very warm welcome to you all to this uh, wonderful evening's talk which is to commemorate 150 years of the discovery of the element helium. Well, we may be wondering, that there are so many elements, so what is the special thing about helium that we have to uh, celebrate it this way? Two reasons. One, the discovery itself is not very easy. It came in the wake of uh, a new technique in science that had just been discovered, namely spectroscopy, about eight or nine years before helium was discovered. And the second reason is that it was discovered on an object away from the earth and its existence on the earth came to be discovered almost 27 years after spectroscopically helium was discovered on another celestial object. So that's a very uh, special uh, thing. To commemorate this particular discovery which has uh, great significance as far as astronomy and uh, cosmology is concerned, we have uh, uh, this uh, special public talk and uh, we take this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to Professor uh, Bhima Nath from Raman Research Institute who will be giving this talk today. So a warm welcome to you sir. Now perhaps even at the time of discovering uh, the, this element helium people would not have anticipated the kind of revolution that this element would make in our day to day lives. And uh, today we find that uh, uh, helium is an almost indispensable element uh, in several applications. So every time somebody undergoes an MRI scan, uh, they have to thank uh, helium for making this technology possible. Because all the superconducting magnets that uh, work at such very, very low temperatures they are realized using uh, liquid, uh, liquefied helium. And uh, in the process, um, uh, medical technology and the medical benefits that we have been deriving by virtue of using helium has been immense. Uh, one can go on listing uh, uh, lots of examples from day-to-day -day life where helium is used. And I'm sure Professor Bhima Nath would be doing that during the course of his talk. So a quick... Uh, uh, introduction about the uh, speaker itself, himself. Uh, Professor Bhima Nath currently works at Raman Research Institute. Uh, he was born in Assam. Just a few years, a couple of years in fact, uh, before the 100th uh, year of the discovery of helium was going to be celebrated. And uh, of course you should not extrapolate and try to guess, uh, guess what his age is now. Okay. Uh, he studied physics at Delhi University and uh, obtained his PhD in astrophysics from the University of Maryland, USA. And he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Max Planck Institute in Bonn, uh, which is a, a, a hotspot for many of the present day undergraduate students who keep looking at uh, Bonn University. So he, uh, Professor Bhima Nath did his postdoctoral work uh, at Max Planck Institute, Germany, and then at Ayuka in uh, Pune. He joined Raman Research Institute in 1997 and has been doing his research uh, since then there. And uh, uh, his main uh, work, areas of work are in investigating the diffuse matter in our universe in the intergalactic uh, medium. And uh, also he is interested in uh, the physical processes which are responsible for ionization of this material in the intergalactic uh, matter. And in recent times he has been working on the possibility of uh, active galaxies which harbor massive black holes in their uh, centers and produce energetic jets depositing energy into the gas that resides in galaxy uh, clusters. Uh, so in 1895 uh, uh, helium was discovered on the earth by William Ramsey and as if to do poetic justice to this discovery almost to the date a hundred years later the primordial helium was discovered uh, uh, which 
lent a, a huge support to the Big Bang Theory if it needed any at, uh, at that particular point of time. And Professor Bhimanath himself being a cosmologist, uh, it's a wonderful coincidence that he should be talking about uh, uh, the significance of the discovery of helium uh, today to us. So once again, I welcome uh, Professor Bhimanath, and now I request him to deliver the talk. Oh, one quick thing, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, one quick thing I should add to his introduction. Uh, he's also a, um, a science popularizer in the sense he writes wonderful articles to uh, newspapers, both in uh, Bengali as well as in uh, uh, English. And he has also written two wonderful books. One is called Nothing is Blue, and the other is called uh, The Dawn of uh, Universe. And also there is a book uh, which I don't have it here. Uh, we don't have it here. It's about the story of uh, helium discovery itself. So uh, uh, for his efforts, he has also been given the, uh, uh, for popularizing science, he has also been recognized by the Indian National Science Academy. Uh, chance to talk to you about um, something interesting that happened today, 150 years ago, um, and in this part of the world. And some of you are probably wondering what that was. So let me, um, so I'm going to talk about the history of uh, the discovery of helium. And well, I couldn't resist the temptation of showing you some of the, it's one of the memes that go around in social media. Uh, it's a play on the uh, word of, uh, he, uh, the symbol for helium, the chemical symbol for helium, H-E and he, the, you know, uh, the father, whatever. So he is everywhere in the heavens and earth. He makes the stars shine, yet he cannot be seen. Um, he is noble, abundant, and fills the universe, and so on and so forth. So helium, we know, is the second lightest element in the universe. So it sits in the uh, periodic table. That's the lone element um, on the right-hand corner, top corner. And we know, now know that it has in its nucleus two protons and two uh, uh, neutrons. It is one of the inert gases, um, so-called noble gases. So it doesn't interact with any other element. It actually doesn't form a molecule uh, interacting with its own uh, uh, atoms also, which is why uh, it's rarely found on Earth, um, although it's found everywhere else. I'll come back to this. So if we take a, a sort of inventory of um, material, all the elements in our universe by mass, uh, this is what it looks like. So one-fourth of it, three-fourth of the normal matter in the universe is made of hydrogen. Roughly one quarter is made of helium. Rest of the, the first quadrant is made of uh, other elements in the periodic table. Three fourths of the universe we don't know. But we, that doesn't concern us here. Uh, so one fourth of the normal matter in the universe is made up of helium. Yet, it's rarely found on the Earth. That's because it's, first of all, it's light. It's one of the, as I said, second lightest element after hydrogen. It's also a noble element so that unlike hydrogen, hydrogen is also light but it's bound as a form of water and other uh, 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 molecules. So it is, it's still found um, on Earth. But helium being an inert element has basically escaped um, because of its lightness. Earth's gravity has not been enough to keep it, uh, keep it um, uh, confined. So whatever helium that we find today, that you find in the helium balloons or anywhere else, comes from mines, deep mines, where basically radioactive gases, uh, they, uh, is, you know, the alpha particle, when they combine with electron, will basically form a helium atom. That's the uh, source of helium uh, today on Earth. Now, the interesting thing is, the most interesting thing about helium as an element is that it was discovered not by a chemist, but by astronomers. And that makes the history uh, of its discovery very interesting. It was the first element and the only element that was discovered by, not by chemists. And its discovery ushered in a totally new field of science, that of astrophysics. And that happened 150 years ago today. Yet, um, unfortunately, maybe interestingly, uh, it's the story of his discovery has become blurred in the collective memory of people, 
historians of science, um, and not only just blurred, I would say even distorted. And um, so that's the story. So what I would like to do today is to tell you the story of what ex exactly happened on that day and how, uh, what was the motivation to look for helium or look at the sun on, on, on that day. Um, to talk about the distortion that, you, that is pervasive in, that you would find in the internet or anywhere else today, uh, if you open Wikipedia, for example, it will tell you a story which is not correct. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, is this a pointer? So this quote from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, it says, in 1868, while observing an eclipse whose path of totality passed over India, the French astronomer Pierre Janssen observed a bright yellow line in the spectrum. Janssen noticed that the yellow line's wavelength was slightly shorter than that of the well-known line of sodium, and he reported his result to the British astronomer Joseph Norman Lockyer, who had missed the eclipse. That's totally wrong. Uh, another example, this is the speech given during the uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, in physics uh, 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 ceremony to um, being given to uh, William Ramsey, who discovered um, all the noble elements, including helium, uh, and the speech by the president of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, who was saying this. To quote, the existence of helium was demonstrated by uh, Janssen during a spectroscopic examination of the solar chromosphere in 1868 while making an observations on an eclipse of the sun in India. That's wrong. And uh, to my knowledge, the only astronomer, who, only historian of science who pointed this out was David Aubin. In, he wrote uh, in 1919, 1999, but he wrote in French. This is the French equivalent of the Scientific American, basically saying that Janssen did not discover helium. But um, I suppose French is not the lingua franca of the world today. So I wanted to take a look at it, and what I found uh, instead is not only that this uh, credit has been wrongly ascribed, but also one person's name has been totally forgotten of the history. And so that's uh, the story I want to talk to you about today. So let's begin at the very beginning. So at the beginning, it was sunlight. And uh, the story begins in 1814 uh, in a Benedictine uh, abbey when Fraunhofer discovered that when you look at the sun through a prism, you not only see the background, uh, uh, the rainbow colors are from blue to red, but you also see dark lines superposed on the solar spectrum of the rainbow colors. You see dark lines, right? So these were named Fraunhofer uh, lines. But uh, the existence, the reason and uh, uh, why uh, they occurred and wh what they meant, uh, it was not clear. And phys physicists basically struggled to explain this for almost four decades. Um, um, there have been some clues, for example, John Herschel and Talbot, uh, they um, uh, noticed that different substances gave different set of bright lines. Now we know, this is the flame test of color uh, elements. Sodium gives uh, uh, yellow color, etc., etc. Okay. So this, the, the, in uh, the beginning of 19th century, this was still, you know, people were still trying to uh, uh, come to terms with it. Brewster, in 1830, he superposed the spectra of the sun and the gas in the lab. And he noticed that there were few dark and bright lines were uh, coincident. Uh, so they postulated, he postulated that one could probably infer the substances in the sun from their spectra. But the origin and the cause of the dark lines remained a mystery for a long time. Leon Foucault probably came uh, very close to an explanation in 1849. You would know Foucault's name from uh, Foucault's pendulum. And so this is a, a picture of the Foucault's pendulum in Ayuka in Pune. Um, so Foucault was a very versatile um, scientist. Um, <clears throat> and so what he did, he basically uh, uh, superposed the, he, uh, he passed, so he, he, he had an arc, electric arc, and he had his spectrum. And it gave, uh, uh, it showed two bright lines. So now we know that you know, most of the you know, objects in the, in, in the lab are contaminated by salt, common table salt, which has sodium. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and so it showed the two bright yellow lines of sodium. Then he passed sunlight through 
uh, the arc uh, and superpose the arc light with the sunlight. Okay? Then he saw that there was a dark line and appeared and the dark line had actually strengthened after the superposition. And so, so this is what I was showing. So he saw that you know, uh, from the sun you of course see the dark lines of uh, Fraunhofer lines. By itself the arc would give a, a bright line uh, in yellow that is because of sodium now we know and when superposed you would see a dark line in the place exactly in the place of the yellow line and also strengthened the dark line has strengthened um, uh, in comparison to the front of our uh, line so he concluded that thus the arc presents us with a medium that emits d ray so d uh, ray uh, was the name of the yellow line in front of our spectrum okay for the sodium uh, emits the D-rays of its own account and which at the same time absorbs them when they come from another quarter. Okay? So, and he, ha there was an idea that, you know, an object probably emits, when it is hot, emits a bright line. Bright line means a color, uh, uh, light of a particular color. And when it's cool and it's set in the path of a background white light, it is going to absorb the same color light of the same color. So he mentioned these ideas during a dinner at uh, Cambridge with Stokes, 1852, who told Lord Kelvin about it. But Foucault himself left the topic and started working on lenses. He was, as I said, he was a very versatile scientist and he left the topic. And uh, so the point was that, you know, there was some idea in the air, uh, some buzz in the air, but people really didn't know what was going on exactly. It was left to the theoretical genius of Gustav Kirchhoff and the experimental genius of uh, Robert Bunsen. So you know the Bunsen burner allows us to look at the color of um, substances when they burn, right? And Kirchhoff had this idea that instead of describing the light by color, let's be more objective about it, let's put a prism in front of it and then we'll know the wavelength so we'll be able to tell the exact um, uh, we'll be able to describe the uh, spectrum of the element of the substance uh, more quantitatively. And they uh, noticed that the dark lines originate from the presence of these substances in the solar atmosphere, which cause bright lines in the same place in the spectrum of a flame. Basically, what uh, Kirchhoff did, he passed an incandescent light through a flame, which had uh, um, with uh, sodium, and saw dark lines. And, uh, uh, but when he passed the sunlight through lithium, the sunlight didn't have any dark lines for lithium. But when it was passed through lithium, there was a dark line. So sun doesn't probably have lithium and a, the spectrum has acquired a dark line due to lithium when passed through the lithium gas. So they were asking themselves, does it mean that the sun has sodium but not uh, lithium? And so, uh, basically, they started uh, wondering whether they can identify elements in the sun and, and around, by looking at the lines. So around that time, um, on one evening, there was a fire in Mannheim, which was like 10 miles from Munich, where they were. And uh, they had a telescope and a spectroscope, and they could identify what was burning in the fire. And it struck them that if they can identify elements far away from the laboratory at a distance, why not apply the same method to the sun? So uh, this, this was reported in, in, in an article in Nature. So Bunsen said, you know, if we could determine the nature of substance burning in Mannheim, why couldn't you do the same for the sun? Kirchhoff said, Bunsen, I've gone mad. And Bunsen said, so have I, Kirchhoff. Um, so, the whole idea, uh, so the Kirchhoff applied the whole idea, so this was uh, um, a spectrum, a solar spectrum published by Kirchhoff at that time and he could infer the presence of, apart from hydrogen, magnesium, calcium, uh, copper, chromium, etc, etc. And here was a n totally new way of identifying element. They themselves discovered cesium and rubidium in the lab. Uh, within a few years, William Crookes in England uh, could uh, isolate thallium and identify it through its, uh, you know, um, uh, spectrum. Chemistry had changed, you know. Um, 
And Kirchhoff, what he did more, came up with a, a theoretical and mathematical uh, theory of um, what should happen to matter and radiation when they are in equilibrium. When matter is absorbing all the radiation that is falling on it and radiation, uh, so th there's a strong interaction between matter and uh, radiation. And in equilibrium, he said, uh, there should be a connection between the emissivity of an element and absorptivity, uh, 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 absorption uh, qualities of an element. And he said that there, there's a proportionality and that ratio, the proportionality ratio is universal. It should not depend on what it is made of. It should only depend on temperature. And that I'm sure some of you who have been studying black body radiation uh, would um, uh, recognize some of these uh, concepts. So that was the year in 1859 uh, he uh, 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 published this paper and now we know that the black body radiation is a universal radiation and depends only on temperature. And here is a, a, a sort of a sketch of uh, black body radiation intensity and its spectrum as a function of its wavelength and how it would differ as we increase and decrease the temperature of any substance. So based on, but Kirchhoff's paper was very, very difficult um, and uh, uh, many people didn't understand what was uh, being explained. So there are a lot of criticisms. So uh, a sample of a few. Kirchhoff's theoretical, uh, so from, this is an editorial from Chemical News in 1861, two years after 1859. By the way, 1859 was a very important year. That was the year, also the year when Darwin published his book. So um, I'm not going to tell you the name of this person. I'll just show you the photograph. He will reappear later. Um, for, uh, so he wrote, uh, the, in the editorial it was written, we considered this law incapable of supporting the actual discoveries with the least cogency and uh, to be untenable, notwithstanding the fact that it has generally been acquiesced to. Uh, okay. There was this father, Angelo Secchi, from Italy. He also wrote, we wanted to say these things less to object to such a distinguished physicist than to prevent science from taking a retrograde course, especially since uh, history shows that persons of great authority in one branch of knowledge often drags along under the weight of their opinion those who are less experienced. This is a pretty caustic remarks. Now, and the reason was that Kirchhoff's model was very different from what was thought uh, about the sun at that time, or the conventional wisdom about the sun. At the time, the, the conventional wisdom was that sun was cold in the core and hot in the surface. Cold means it's black, and on the surface it's hot. And um, so, sunspots basically, so this idea goes back to William Herschel, the discoverer of uh, Uranus and who was very influential astronomer and uh, so his words carried weight. But Kirchhoff said something different. He said that the core was hot and the atmosphere, solar atmosphere, the outer portions were cooler, which is why they're absorbing the light from the core and producing the dark lights. Okay. Now, there was one testable prediction of Kirchhoff's model. He said that the outer portions may be relatively cooler than the core of the sun. Now we know that it is correct because the core of the sun is 15 million degrees and the atmosphere is about 6,000 degrees. Now what Kirchhoff said, well if you could isolate the outer portion, light from the outer portion of the, of the sun, then you would see bright lines. The dark lines would reverse exactly at the same wavelengths. Okay. So the idea is to isolate somehow the light from the outer portions. Okay? I don't know whether I've uh, got it across to you. If basically the, what he was saying is the solar atmosphere, the outer portions, is relatively cooler than the core. And the core emits hot light in all uh, wavelengths. The atmosphere, the elements in the atmosphere are cooler, so they absorb certain light of certain colors. Now, if I just look at the bright outside portion, the outer layer, then it should just emit on its own and I should be able to see bright lights, exactly the same place as the dark lines, front of our light. And that needed a solar, uh, the only way one could isolate the outer portions of the sun was to wait for a total solar eclipse. And 
a, um, so this is the uh, prediction that the, 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 the front of our line should reverse if the spectrum from the, only the outer layer could be isolated. And the only way it could be done was uh, during a total solar eclipse and a total solar eclipse was in the offing. So there was a paper in um, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society uh, written by a major James Francis Tennant of Bengal Sappers. Um, so let me introduce you one of the interesting characters in this story of helium. So uh, uh, a major tenant was in uh, the East India Company Army um, and uh, he was involved in the, in the great trigonometrical survey uh, at, the, at the time that was going on, mostly in the east-west uh, line, grid lines. Uh, but he was um, uh, mostly working on the western side and he was in Karachi. He was the first person to, who determined the latitude of uh, Karachi, uh, the, the, the coordinates of Karachi and wrote a paper on that. And slowly became his, becoming a surveyor, you know, they have to work on, with the theodolite. And he became interested in the working of a theodolite, which is very similar to a telescope, as you know, the, the, the surveying instrument that the geologists use. And he became interested in an engineering problem, how to balance the weight of a telescope. So those days, you know, one has to balance by adding additional weights, which he found was a very cumbersome way of doing it. So he wanted to relieve the pressure through a fluid. Uh, so that was a very um, interesting idea at that time, and that became the cornerstone of making large telescopes in the beginning of 20th century, um, where large telescopes, the, the, uh, the weight was being relieved through, uh, um, a, a, through mercury in um, filled tubes. And uh, so his name uh, has been also forgotten in this uh, connection. But at that time, his uh, effort was much appreciated. So he wrote this paper saying that, you know, there was going to be a long eclipse, almost uh, six minutes, which is very, very long comes, uh, when it comes to uh, solar eclipses. Totality, uh, you know, um, uh, lasting for about more than six minutes is, is, is a rarity. And uh, he uh, predicted the path of the totality. As you can see, this is from his original paper. This is going through the peninsula of India. Uh, this is Andhra. This is Maharashtra. So it's going to cut Swad across. Uh, um. So Tennant uh, at that time was, um, as I said, in East India Company. And then he was recalled back to East India Company Army during the 1857 mutiny. So he fought at a battle near Kashmiri Gate in, in, in Delhi. Later on, he uh, also had to go to uh, the modern day Lucknow uh, to lift the siege um, around the residency. Uh, there was this Nawab of Awadh. And uh, so at that time, he had a chance to look at the. Uh, Awadh uh, had an observatory with modern telescopes, modern equipments. So um, Tennant uh, took a look at the uh, equipments in Lucknow and wrote a paper in monthly notices on those equipments. Um, let me um, also, but there was uh, some um, <coughs> other voices around that time. So let me, to give you an idea, around that time the reigning philosophy uh, was that of positivism. Um, uh, and this is the uh, this is uh, Comte, Auguste Comte, who thought, and the, the idea was that one should not waste time thinking about unsolvable problems. And one of the examples that was given for unsolvable problems was that, for example, the chemical composition of the sun that will never be people will never be able to know. So one should not waste time on doing this. One should try to solve things that are solvable. That was called the positivism. And a uh, lot of uh, it actually uh, uh, influenced a lot of people, a lot of scientists, and so, and which is why this new science of astrophysics uh, it tech attracted. Uh, there was a lot of amateurs, what we call amateurs, who didn't have any formal training in science. They jumped into this this void. Um, uh, regular astronomers, of course, scoffed at them. There were some reasons because. This new field of astrophysics required l knowing few other things, for example, photography, a bit of chemistry, spectroscopy, 
which the regular observatories didn't have all these equipments. Their research plan did not fit uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the <coughs> all these things. And uh, uh, regular astronomers like Otto Struve, um, he once even said that God forbid that astronomy should be carried away by a fascination with novelty and diverge from the essential basis which he thought of the classical astronomy. Just uh, note down the position and the motions of stars, that's enough. Okay. Why do you want to know what stars are made of? And so enter a, a few characters who, are, who were amateurs uh, by all means and they became the pioneers of astrophysics. For example, there is uh, Warren De La Rue, I don't know how to pronounce his name properly. He was a paper manufacturer and he became a pioneer in astrophotography. He um, was one of the first, people, uh, first persons to take the photograph of the sun of the moon, of the sun during a solar eclipse of 1859. Uh, I've already mentioned James Francis Tennant, who was an engineer in the army, but became interested in astronomy through working with theodolite, etc., etc. William Huggins in England gave up his uh, trading in silk. He was a silk merchant. And he gave up and, and bought a telescope, set up a telescope in his own house. And um, I'll tell more about him later. Um, there was Norman Lockyer. Now uh, I'm showing the name of the uh, picture of this person I mentioned earlier. He was one of the editors of the Chemical News. So this is Norman Lockyer. He was a clerk in the war office in London. And on the side he used to write science articles. Once he stumbled on uh, uh, a, uh, a neighbor who had telescope and he was fascinated. This neighbor showed him, you know, what a telescope was. And so he bought a telescope of his own. Then he uh, became friends of uh, William Huggins. And then th he also became interested in the spectroscopy of the sun at his home. This is uh, Father Angelo Secchi. I mentioned him earlier. He was a Jesuit priest from Italy. Uh, and he became interested in, in astronomy while he was in US. So all Jesuits in, from Italy had to escape uh, when there was a French, during a French occupation, okay? Um, so this is Protestant Catholic stuff. Um, and so when he came back, he was uh, given uh, the, uh, uh, the, he was made in charge of the observatory in Roman College in Italy. So at that time in Italy, there was a lot of complaint against, by the nationalists, against the clergy. The clergy, the, the priests are not modern enough uh, and they should not, uh, you know, come in the way of uh, making uh, uh, in the nationalists. So the Pope at that time made an effort to show that, you know, no, we are modern enough. So, so he got Father Secchi to uh, uh, be in charge of the observatory in, in Roman College, gave him a lot of grants, a lot of new equipment, and he also became interested in the spectroscopy of the sun. And uh, let me uh, quote from a, a um, John Langford uh, in, from his article, Amateurs and Astrophysicists. The new specialty of astrophysics did not develop in the university context. Astrophysical studies often started outside established observatories. The problems that astrophysicists initially sought to explain placed a premium on the design, construction, and the manipulation of complicated research equipment rather than on the theoretical knowledge. So here was a field where amateurs might excel, and they did. So, um, uh, this is William Huggins, I have told you about him. He um, gave up his merchant in, uh, in silk, and this is his wife. So, both of them, um, the couple, uh, they, uh, they observed, started observing. He once heard a lecture on the, um, by a student of Bunsen in, uh, and became interested in looking at uh, the spectrum of the stars. And, uh, and so, Look at his passion that he is writing in his um, uh, he writing in his diary. Nearly every observation revealed a new fact, and almost every night's work was red lettered by some discovery. I mean, the passion of these guys, the new the, the amateurs, were uh, made up for all the formal training that they lacked. Okay, um, I mentioned um, uh, normal uh, Lockyer, and uh, I also mentioned uh, Father Angelo Sacchi. And he had a young visitor, a young visitor from France in 1863. This is Jules uh, Pierre Janssen. 
he had problems walking because of a childhood accident. I don't know exactly what it was, but I think his uh, nanny dropped him when he was a child. And so he uh, had a limp while walking. But he was a globe-trotting sign. He never finished school, but he, um, uh, he couldn't attend school, but uh, he finished his PhD, did a PhD on the optics of the retina. I never got a job, a regular job of an astronomer, uh, because at that time, um, the director of the Paris Observatory was the same person who had discovered Neptune, an old-style astronomer. But uh, Janssen had friends in high places uh, in the academy, French Academy, and through them he managed to get grants to go uh, to different places, South America, uh, uh, to Alps. Uh, for example, he was trying to look at the Fraunhofer lines, whether they varied with altitude, and it, that he found that some lines varied with the altitude. So he said that those lines come from the atmosphere of the Earth because there is variation with the altitude. And he had designed and constructed the best spectroscope that was possible at that time. So, I mean, which has the largest resolving power to, um, to, to separate even closely spaced lines, right? So he had the best spectroscope and he had come to uh, visit Sachi. Um, uh, so he could convince the academy that the 1868 eclipse was going to be very important and that the dark lines in the solar spectrum must reverse at the outer line layer if Kirchhoff was right. Uh, by the way, here is a picture I, of, uh, uh, so just to uh, tell you another story of Janssen, how uh, adventurous he was. Um, there was, this is later than um, after the 1868 uh, eclipse. In 1870, there was an eclipse in Algiers. And he wanted to, there was a siege around Paris by the Prussian army. And so he couldn't go to Algiers, right? So he just got on a hot air balloon and went to Algiers. Okay. So, uh, indomitable guy. So, at that time, uh, there was a, uh, uh, the French team, the, uh, they wanted to send an expedition, but they wanted to send an expedition to Thailand because of two things. Uh, the French territory in India, the Pondicherry, didn't really lie on the totality belt. Also, the king of Siam was more sympathetic to French than, than, than the British. So, uh, uh, the Paris Observatory, they uh, uh, mounted a, an, an ex expedition to uh, Thailand without Janssen. Janssen got his own individual grant from the academy and uh, he decided to go to India alone. Okay. Um, so, at that time, Huggins, back in England, he said that he didn't need the, any eclipse. He noticed that the outer layer of the sun, there were prominences, what we, we, we now call the prominences, um, basically solar storms rising from the surface of the sun, and it looked red. So he said, if I can isolate red color from the sun, I would basically pick up the light from the outer layers. I don't need to go and chase an eclipse. So this was uh, Huggins' idea. Uh, he tried to take a spectrum by using red filter, but wasn't successful. Lockyer also was planning to do the same thing. Uh, but for that, you need to know where the prominences are. So, uh, you know, he had to fish around for the prominences, and he was not successful. At that time, uh, Lockyer got a grant from the Royal Society to build a telescope, but the telescope maker fell ill. So this was the summer of 1868. Um, at the same time, Major Tennant, he got some grant from the Royal Astronomical Society to organize an eclipse team and the focus was going to be uh, on photography because the last time uh, the sun was photographed was just about 1859, seven years ago. And uh, so this was a good time to try out uh, photography. But photography at the, the, back then was very cumbersome. Uh, it was, uh, uh, people used to u use wet glass for developing and uh, one needed a good coordination and it took a long time to develop. So six minutes, one could possibly take about five or six uh, frames. So uh, Tennant, being from the army, came up with a, a sort of military drill with his assistants how to go about doing this uh, photography thing. Right? So he got this telescope in, in, uh, and he went to Guntur. <clears throat> uh, in, in which fell in the uh, totality belt. 
he had uh, also a spectroscope and some polarizers. John Herschel, this is the son of William Herschel, the discoverer of Uranus. John Herschel, whose picture I had briefly shown, he had his two sons stationed in India at that time. The younger son, John Herschel, again the same name, was actually stationed in Bangalore. Uh, the eldest son was somewhere in Bengal in Odisha. He was working on something, something completely different and very interesting. He was working on fingerprints. And the elder brother would write a, a, a paper in Nature in 1888 on fingerprinting. So the younger brother, was John Herschel, was here in Bangalore, uh, again associated with uh, the, the surveying part of uh, uh, East India Army. And his father basically uh, said that, you know, uh, to focus on spectroscopy, because Kirchhoff's idea had to be tested. Okay, that was the whole idea, that do the dark lines reverse to bright lines or not? That's the, uh, that's the goal. While all these things were going on, another astronomer from India was watching all this in helplessness, silence, and in agony. This is Norman Pogson. Uh, he was a self-taught astronomer, uh, come, came from a hosiery family in Manchester, um, apprenticed with uh, 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 an instrument maker, then became an assistant uh, at the Radcliffe Observatory in Oxford, where he actually worked upon on a system of measuring the brightnesses of stars that we still use today, the magnitude system. Uh, but he couldn't get a job. Uh, he realized that he wouldn't get a job in regular job of an astronomer in England without a Cambridge or an Oxford degree. Uh, uh, ultimately, he came to India as the government astronomer and at the Madras Observatory at that time in 1861. Um, and, but his whole idea, his, he thought his whole idea was to survey the southern stars which couldn't be seen from the northern continents. But as soon as he came here, George Adey, the Royal Astronomer back in England, said that you don't have to do this. I have somebody else in Sydney who is going to do this. And since then, his relation with his peers back in England went downhill. Um, Pogson complained about his salary, his projects, his assistants. Most were dolts, machines without the certainty of machinery. Okay, living condition. Uh, this is from his uh, reports, uh, very colorful language. First observations in India taken in the compound, in happy, fearless ignorance of snakes, centipedes, scorpions, and all the filthy, dangerous vermin abounding in my new home. But he, uh, he made uh, observations of, uh, he discovered some of, uh, asteroids um, the, for, the, for the first time in, from Asia, um, uh, despite all this. Um, and he looked at, he, he was watching all the expedition, you know, um, arrangement that were be being made by Tennant and Janssen, and uh, he was refused any grant to um, mount any expedition. Um, and he wrote once, uh, I have never been able to comprehend the peculiar ground upon which European observers justified their needless and lavish expenditure. So what he did, he realized there's a coastal town of Machlipatnam in Andhra, was also in the totality belt. And four years before this, there was a severe cyclone in Machlipatnam. So there was people were talking about uh, setting up a weather station uh, in Machlipatnam. And uh, Pogson got himself the job of a meteorologist. And he said that he was going to go to Machlipatnam to set up a weather uh, station. In the same process, he also uh, got some engineers from the railways and the telegraph department. So a telegraph department was just coming at that time. Uh, in 1868, earlier in that year, there was a telegraph line was being set up uh, by the Siemens company through Iran and Afghanistan. So in Andhra, there was a telegraph um, 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 station in Vijayawada. And so he got some telegraph uh, the engineers from there, uh, got some telescope, and went to Machlipatnam. He also managed to get a spectroscope from Huggins uh, on his uh, by personal. Uh, and uh, okay, Tennant and Janssen, they, as I said, chose uh, Guntur. Guntur was a very you know, small, desolate town at that time. Um, the weather apparently was so bad, and uh, the, the the social. Uh, um, uh, uh, 
the, most of the officers didn't want to stay there for more than five years. So, uh, you know, try to imagine what the new look it must have got uh, when the, you know, two European team, uh, this, they came and, you know, landed in Guntur. So this is uh, a picture, uh, a sketch I made of uh, tenant's team camp. Uh, he camped at um, the grounds of the house residence of the sub-collector in Guntur. Um, how boring the social life at that time in Guntur was to just to show you an example. Uh, this is from Frankenberg's um, report on Guntur around that time. A European widow remarked on the boring social life saying, after dinner the company all sit around talking whispers and scratch mosquito bites, talking about promotions while ladies gossiped about ayahs and scandals. And so you may imagine now on, you know, before 18th August, this small town took a totally different look. Um, uh, while Tennant set up his camp uh, at the sub-collector's uh, residence, Janssen found himself um, uh, uh, a, the house of a French tobacco merchant. So Guntur there was a, uh, is a known for tobacco trading at that time. Um, and whose house happened to be the tallest in Guntur and also had a terrace. You know? But, uh, but Janssen got his luggage misplaced while December came from in Madras. But uh, so he didn't, he couldn't get his big telescopes, but he had the small equipments, including the spectroscope with him, so with which he could uh, observe. Now, August is not a very good month for uh, observations, astronomical observation, as we now know. You know, it's a monsoon time, and they knew they and uh, the risks and so they were very anxious whether they would be able to see the uh, sun at all or not so 1860 uh, in 18th august 150 years ago so the eclipse was supposed to start around 9 a.m totality was supposed to start around 10. before 9 a.m people were just waiting you know for the sun to come up and there was a morning mist and sun was clouded and uh, uh, people didn't know what's going to happen but um, as the eclipse started around nine, the partial, you know, the, the shadow of the moon, uh, the, the moon started uh, blocking the sun. The morning mist actually cleared away. Tennant's um, assistant focused on, as I said, photography, and he wanted to take, do some dress rehearsal before the actual totality began. But the call for the rehearsal was taken for the call for the totality. So one frame was lost. And the clock drive of the telescope started malfunctioning. So afterwards, they had to basically track it uh, manually. Anyway, they managed to get six photographs. So this is one of the photographs that tenants took, tenant uh, team uh, took that day. So six minutes, uh, six um, uh, photographs. Um, um, Janssen saw, uh, okay, and Masli Patnam, pokes and uh, worried about a crowd gathered around his equipments. Again, in his colorful language, he writes, the two inquisitive and meddlesome loiterers who not contented with looking must finger the thermometers and the temper with the instruments. Okay. No wonder that he didn't get, get along with his peers in England. Um, so everybody saw the bright lines. Janssen saw the bright lines. So that's exactly what they were hoping to see. If Kirkokov is right, then the sun's outer layer, although it's relatively cooler than the core, it is hot. Uh, you know, and it's going to emit uh, b bright lines. And so Janssen Tennant saw a bright yellow line, and they thought it was due to sodium, because that's, they were familiar with the yellow line in the sodium, okay. Herschel, John Herschel, uh, he, he went to Jamkandi in Maharashtra. So he saw uh, this bright line too, and then he said, he wrote, no question that the orange line was identified with D. D means the sodium line of uh, Fraunhofer. Hoxon was not so sure. And he thought the line was either coincident or very near D. And that doubt is what uh, gave rise to the discovery of helium. Janssen also saw the prominences. And so the day after the, uh, after the eclipse, uh, it was clouded over. And uh, so everybody packed up, tenant uh, packed up and went. Janssen said he thought he was going to try out looking at the sun, at the prominences, because now he knows where the prominences are. And he wanted to try out the same idea that Huggins and Lockyer had back in England, that I'm going to try putting my slit 
uh, on one of the prominences. Okay, slit means you know we just block out everything else, just uh, except a small uh, slit, and then take the spectrum, right? So he woke up next day at 3 a.m., set up his instruments, and wanted to see whether he can see the outer layers of the sun without the eclipse, right? And he was successful. And uh, so he said that you know I have seen a perpetual eclipse. And he sent off a telegram to Paris. As I said, you know, there was a telegraph uh, 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 station in Vijayawada. And he decided to study more, uh, some more, uh, before sending a detailed report on 19th September. Um, Lockyer and others heard about the discovery through the tele telegram. Lockyer got his telescope on 20th of October and immediately tried. That day he didn't go to office. Um, so he, uh, in the morning itself, he tried out. Uh, putting a slit on the prominences and saw the bright line spectrum, including a yellow line which was very near D. And he sent a brief report to the French Academy. So um, uh, Janssen did um, much more uh, uh, than what I have just described and there's no time for doing this. I have written a book on this, so the more interested, uh, the curious among you may take a look at uh, the more detailed descriptions. And these two letters, one from sent from England on 20th of October and one sent from India on 19th of September. So he sent, uh, Johnson sent the report from Kakinara. Uh, then he went off to Calcutta, then to Shimla and was doing other experiments which are actually uh, very pioneering experiments on the sun. But these two letters sent from, one sent from England and one sent from India, halfway across the globe, separated by a month, they reached Paris same day within a few hours. And that coincidence was so unique that the French Academy uh, wanted to uh, celebrate this and, uh, um, and declared them, Lockyer and Janssen, the, the discoverer of a method of studying the solar spectrum without the aid of eclipse. Not the discovery of helium, please note. Okay. Um, Lockyer then went on to discover uh, chromosphere, which is the red layer beyond the photosphere of the sun, um, but he was very rough uh, and his aggressive uh, nature um, uh, was not, uh, didn't make him many friends in the, in the England academia. He started collaborating with Edward Franklin, a chemist, by the way, who is the father of the valence theory that we study in schools. So Franklin, uh, and he was starting, uh, and tried to look at the uh, spectrum of hydrogen under different pressure. Maybe it's the line is from hydrogen itself, maybe under different pressure, but they're, they're, uh, it was not successful. Uh, and then Lockyer started thinking that maybe it's a different element altogether and named helium because from Helios. Um, uh, Franklin didn't like that idea. He was a very conservative uh, scientist. And at the time he wrote later, I remember always protesting about this yellow line, about this assumption that it's a different element altogether. Let's, let me give you a flash forward of what later the historians remember about this phase. Um, in 1896, Charles Young, an American astronomer, wrote, most of the observers of 1868 uh, eclipse suppose it to be helium line. It's not true. If you look at Janssen's original papers, he never mentions that. He said that it's sodium. But Janssen noted it's non-coincidence. Foxon's name was totally forgotten. Uh, Franklin proposed for the new substance which is also wrong. Franklin didn't like the idea of a new element altogether. He protested uh, a provisional name of helium. So this is 1896, you know. Only that I, uh, the, 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 more, the most truthful uh, account I could find uh, in the words of Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, who wrote in 1947, uh, referring to the yellow line, Pogson said that it was D or near D, almost the whole of the story of helium depends on this distinction. Um, by the way, Charles Young, there was a, a total solar eclipse in 1870, uh, two years later, in, in visible from North America, and Charles Young discovered a bright green line um, and called the new uh, element uh, coronium. By the way, this was uh, a hand-painted uh, spectrum drawn by Pogson from Machlipatnam on 18th August. And you can see that there is a green line there. Poxon saw the green line, but his name is, of course, not mentioned. 
In 1868, everybody else published their papers. Even casual observers, they could write a, a letter to monthly notices of Royal Astronomical Society and their paper was published. Pogson's paper was never published. In 1868, his wife lay uh, dying of cholera. And uh, he had problems getting the money to publish his reports. So uh, he published his report from the government, uh, you know, on his own effort. Um, with this uh, picture, for example, this is kept in Indian Institute of I uh, Astrophysics archive. Um, anyway, so um, so Charles Young finds a new line, green line, calls it coronium. So now there is a new game. Everybody sees a new line, bright line, and thinks a new uh, element. And there was a lot of confusion. Some suspect that maybe the helium and the coronium are the same element. Okay, adding to the new uh, uh, confusion. William Huggins, they saw, found a new line in the planetary nebula, uh, 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 cat's eye nebula in 1864. So nebula is uh, basically, planetary nebula is what you get when a star at the end of its red giant phase, uh, it gives off uh, the outer layer. And so this is uh, the cat's eye nebula. And they saw a pair of lines they could not identify with any terrestrial element. So they, um, they thought is a uh, different element called nebulium. Okay? So this caused a lot of confusion. Uh, D3, this uh, line that was seen uh, apart from the uh, yellow uh, sodium lines, was discovered in a nova in 1868, uh, 60, uh, 76. Uh, nova means uh, it's an eruption, it's an explosion on a star, on a binary system. So this is the first time these lines were seen in an object other than the sun. Um, 1886, D3 line was also discovered in Orion Nebula. At that time, there was another, uh, adding to the confusion, was a claim by a geologist from Italy, Luigi Palmieri, who said, who claimed that he saw the bright yellow line, uh, the D3 line, from a substance that he, uh, a gas that he collected during an eruption in Vesuvius in 1881, but he couldn't substantiate his claim because he did not collect any sample. This caused some problems of priority after the helium was discovered in 1895, but um, let's move on. So at that time, uh, people wanted to, there, there was this idea that you know, helium was being seen not on the Earth, but Sun, Orion Nebula, and other astronomical objects. Um, Lockyer suggested at the time that the spectrum of element depend on temperature. It was very precise, which now we know because of the work of Meghnath Saha, which by the way uh, would be a hundred years of uh, Saha's uh, work. Um, now we know that the spectrum of uh, stars depend on temperature. Lockyer thought that maybe at higher temperature, he assumed that the nebula are at higher temperature than the sun. At those temperatures, element were in more primordial form, okay? And uh, matter uh, evolved and cooled from this primal matter in nebula to stars. Now, we also know, know that, you know, William Prout noticed that, you know, the element, the atomic weights of elements are uh, multiples of, um, of a fundamental unit. And that fundamental unit could not be hydrogen because, for example, of fractional weights of chlorine, 35.5, so it couldn't be hydrogen some other element should be the fundamental uh, 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 unit. So there was an idea, maybe helium is the fundamental unit. And helium is probably more primal because it appears only in nebula and in stars, not on Earth. And the problem will be solved if the helium has an atomic weight half of hydrogen, then all the problem is solved. So there was this idea, you know, the helium could be this primal matter and maybe the, it's lighter than hydrogen. Uh, William Crookes uh, gave a lecture on this in 1886. So for him, uh, the primal matter could be, he described this as formless mist, a substance with the potential of becoming and evolving into atoms. Uh, Crookes, you would remember, was uh, the discovery of thallium, and was a, a respected physicist uh, on its own. Uh, but Crookes also had a bad reputation of having seen in the presence of mediums, um, you know, the seances, 
the spirits and he used to take pictures of him with the medium. So this is a picture of Crooks in one of the medium. Uh, so when he started talking about formless mist and potential of becoming, you know, uh, he, he got, uh, this idea got a flag, a lot of flag. Even, so at the time, the high priest of chemistry was uh, Dmitry Mendeleev. Right? He scoffed at the whole hypothesis of helium. He didn't like the idea of helium at all. And he came to give uh, the Faraday lecture in 1889. He said, astrophysics is still, for want of laws, at the epoch of accumulation of facts and not of their position. But he himself was interested in the helium line. And so there was uh, an, a total eclipse in 1887 over Moscow. He got, off, uh, got on a balloon to observe the eclipse, but it was clouded over, so he couldn't see it. Um, later on, though, he, in 1903, after helium was discovered on Earth, he had suggested that there are probably two more noble gases, uh, Newtonium and Coronium, which was seen by Poxon and um, Charles Young, and then they had atomic weights less than hydrogen. This was wrong. So now we know that it's wrong, but even you know, Mendeleev uh, wrote this paper. By this time, Janssen had moved away from uh, spectral analysis. Um, he kept going to different places. He came back to India in 1871 during another uh, solar eclipse uh, in southern India. And he noticed um, very important stuff, uh, the, the correlation between the sunspot and the corona and the relation between them. Now we know which are all correct. He invented something very interesting based on the idea of Colt's revolver, which you know, when you press a trigger, it uh, rotates a little bit and a bullet comes into the place, right? So he thought he could take, he could put films and he, he would pull trigger and would take pictures in quick succession, okay? So that was the beginning of cinematography. And he went to 1874 in Nagasaki. Uh, doing the Venus transit of the sun. Ladies and gentlemen, this is probably the, this is, this happened 20 years before Lumiere Brothers, 1874, okay? You could call this a movie, I'm sure. Because this is basically a succession of a few frames that he took with what he called a, a, a photographic revolver, okay? And, uh, but his, uh, the fact that he was a pioneer in cinematography was not uh, forgotten. In 1895, um, um, there was a conference in Lyon on cinematography and uh, this is Janssen arriving at the conference um, of, uh, you know, commemorating and, and this is the heydays of the cinematography, the first, you know, designs were being made, etc., etc. So he had moved away from all this. Norman Poxon died in 1891, largely ignored by his peers. Um, and uh, he was not even considered for the directorship of the Kodaikanal Observatory, which came up uh, later on. Uh, Huggins um, wrote, not a very good recommendation, right? I need not say that the present Madras astronomer would not be the man for the new observatory. Success depends on the right man, a new broom. Um, this is um, his, um, he was buried in Madras, in Chennai. This is uh, St. John's Cathedral. Um, I got a picture of this today, uh, a friend of mine um, and, uh, who went to the cemetery and took this picture today uh, of Poxon. Um, Huggins had a war of words with Lockyer because th the nebulium that Huggins had been uh, hypothesizing, Lockyer thought it is magnesium, magnesium in some different form. And there was a nasty war of words. Huggins wrote to George Hale, a very prominent uh, solar astronomer at that time, uh, these attacks of lawyer are giving us much pain. Us means the couple, Margaret and William Huggins. It is difficult to keep them from eating out of our lives all joy. Okay. And at that time, a v there was a, 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 an American geologist made a very mundane discovery of a nitrogen-like gas coming out of um, a sample of uraninite that he discovered. Uh, um, and he, uh, this gas had some peculiar uh, properties. Um, and, but uh, he wrote this paper in 1887, nobody took notice. Eight years later, a curator, a mineralogist of British Museum noticed this paper 
and uh, alerted uh, uh, Lord Rayleigh and William Ramsey because they were working on the noble gases, the, the nitrogen-like elements and the mixing with uh, noble gases, um, so argon, xenon, krypton, etc., etc. And so uh, Ramsey uh, uh, collected this gas from a sample of cleavite. It's uh, uh, similar to uraninite. And he called, uh, uh, asked Crookes to look at the spectrum, and Crookes saw that is the, it has that line, D3 line. And so helium was finally discovered in 1895. Um, Lockyer, by that time, had um, um, uh, floated this uh, scientific journal called Nature. Lockyer was the first editor, and he wrote in 1897, the 26-year-old helium had at last been run to earth D3 was at last visible in a laboratory. But the story is not so uh, totally over. First of all, there was a Swedish group who had also done the similar thing independently, but they didn't uh, uh, pursue their, uh, uh, their uh, the claim to the helium discovery. And uh, the William Ramsey, in his Nobel lecture, he acknowledged the Swedish group. But there was some problem. Uh, Rungen Pastian, uh, he claimed that, they claimed that, you know, helium, there was not one line, but there, was a, there were two lines. And uh, so was the helium that was seen the helium or something else? Okay, so there was some confusion. And Huggins probably, you know, liked the whole idea that, you know, he, uh, Lockyer's helium was getting as much flack as his nebulium. So he wrote to, uh, Huggins wrote to George Hale, saying the helium plot thickens. Um, Lockyer wanted, he was in a hurry to name another element. So this may, must be some another element. He, he thought, he called it uh, tentatively asterium, but he was dissuaded by others. Um, much later, um, uh, with the advent of quantum mechanics, uh, Heisenberg and Bond wrote that there are two forms of helium uh, because of the, you know, the two electrons now and then the, uh, the spins could be parallel or anti-parallel. And so one is called the orthohelium or the parahelium. And so the two lines are from two different forms of helium. So now we know this in hindsight. Having known the actual history and what the historians of science remember it, um, uh, the, the way they remember it, um, one asks this question, why are there some myths in, in you know, science history? I mean, it's not that you know, there was any you know, lack of uh, resources or material at that time. Even now, in the internet, uh, you can actually, if you want, you can find these uh, you know, primary sources. But, um, so there are a few reasons why these uh, myths persist. And I think, uh, so for one thing is, science is always a sort of a you know, multi-participant activity. Uh, unique, uh, moments or eureka moments are, are uh, most often myths. Galileo never really dropped any ball from Pisa Tower. This was a story floated by one of his juniors after Galileo died. F um, uh, Franklin never flew a kite. That story also has been debunked. Okay? Now, there are, uh, um, another reason is that, you know, we often tend to look at the past with the lens, through the lens of the present. And to judge the distant past uh, with the criteria, through the criteria of the present criteria. And so, uh, so uh, Stephen Jay Gould has uh, named this uh, tendency called presentism. And so it favors the successful researchers, ignores the also rants. And uh, also we often prefer a linear story than a nonlinear narrative, right? And so the blind alleys and false sense dead ends are overlooked, as John uh, Waller has uh, mentioned. Sometimes scientists themselves distort the story to, you know, uh, the throw people off the scent to something very embarrassing. Uh, one example is that of uh, Joseph Lister, who is known uh, for the cleanliness in his hospitals, but in reality was uh, not so. Also, we tend to romanticize the past, right? We all like a good story. Um, and this has led to the reshaping of accounts of major discoveries of into fireside stories, much richer in drama than in veracity. So what is the connection with the helium story? So my, I think there are two things here. One is that there's a uniqueness of the Lockyer and Janssen story. This was unique in Victorian science. 
There was a lot of debate about priority. Who discovered this uh, first? Uh, and there were a lot of, um, you know, very nasty uh, 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 fights. You know about Newton and Leibniz, about also the, you know, discovery of Neptune. There was a uh, debate over the priority between British and French scientists. In the background of all this, their story stands out as unique. They never had any fight, right? And, and the, the coincidence of these two letters arriving at the same time, the absence of any dispute over priority, it has the key requirements of uh, all the good story, you know, and also for romant romanticizing the past. So what people remembered in 1895, when helium was finally discovered, is that they did something together, but what they did together was not uh, for was forgotten. So they're often, you, you know, Wikipedia and other pages would say that you know they're the joint discoverers of helium, but that's not true. Also, astrophysics had moved on. Uh, by that time, by the end of uh, 19th century, uh, it was mostly in the realm of professional astronomers in large observatories. So, what Lockyer and Janssen did was also in a very, you know, distant past for them. So, there was every, you know, reason for romanticizing the past. And um, um, so, these two uh, elements, I think, uh, contributed to uh, making a lot of myths about the story. Um, it's also true that you know science has now changed into has now has totally changed its uh, uh, a format today, a, a, its flavor today. Now there are lots of people doing you know uh, are scientists working on similar problems, thousand people writing papers together, and so it is much more multi-participant than it, it ever was, and so all the you know scope of a great myth like stories, unique stories, eureka moments are gone. But you can't have both. Anyway, so I thought, I, I, I hope I have been able to tell you the story of what happened 150 years ago. Not just uh, the discovery of helium. To me, it, is, it was also the day when Kirchhoff's idea was confirmed. And Kirchhoff's idea, everybody knows, uh, the thermodynamics is at the core of physics, much more than quantum mechanics or anything. Thermodynamics is one of the cores uh, uh, that uh, is considered infallible by physicists. And one of the core ideas of thermodynamics was confirmed 150 years ago by seeing the bright lines, the dark lines reversed to bright lines. Thank you very much.